Good morning, LBC Radio. My name is Corey Rosen, and you're listening to the Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super awesome guest, Mr. Louis Bechtold. Louis Dean Bechtold, otherwise known as Louis Dean, lives in Lancaster, PA, where he founded and manages Blues on the Loose, the last popular music band in a section of five bands over 42 years. Mostly performing as vocal front and harmonica, Louis has also played bass guitar and drums. Besides the desire to perpetuate and help preserve American blues music, Lewis buys and sells decorative arts and antiques. He is a proud member of the Blues Society of Central PA, Bucks County, Delaware, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. With Blues on the Loose, Lewis has won backing by the Steel City Blues Society to compete in the 2020 International Blues Challenge at Memphis, Tennessee. He has recorded Original material on a 2019 release by the Blues Society of Central PA, Backyard Blues, that has received international play. More recently, Blues on the Loose was nominated as Blues Band of the Year for 2021 by the Central PA Music Awards and Hall of Fame Foundation. They are performing on average every other weekend and enjoy developing new fans to live blues music. You can find Lewis and his projects at facebook.com forward slash the blues on the loose or his website blues on the loose.com. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. So, what was it that got you inspired uh, into blues music? Was it as a kid? Was it as a teenager? What was it? I, I think it was when I was going to school in New Haven. I met this, I met all the street musicians because I was a soda jerk in their popular hangout. So, I became kind of a favorite guy. <laughs> and uh, this fellow, Andy Merwin, he was a Vietnam veteran, and uh, he was just one of those guitar players that went from gig to gig to gig to gig and spent a lot of time drinking beer at George and Harry's, where I was the soda jerk. Uh, anyway, he, he kind of was the first introduction to blues music, and this would have been in 1970. Uh, first introduced me to... Um, well, he was hung up on some of the Who, and, and there was some, uh, they had been covering some blues songs. The whole English music scene was covering a lot of American blues. And, and then he, I also got turned on to uh, Richard Newell, the King Biscuit Boy from Hamilton, Ontario, mm. in his uh, early release in 1970. And uh, original music, I think he called it. And um, I was just astounded by this guy blowing harmonica and singing the way he did and the type of music he was doing. I had been a drummer through high school in, in the orchestra and the band, and, uh, and I enjoyed that. But I couldn't take my drums to uh, school with me at the culinary. So my roommate, who had just been at Woodstock, played a guitar and suggested I get a harmonica. So then uh, that, was, that was the beginning of that with um, uh, trying to learn how to work with the instrument, trying to learn how to work with him as an accompaniment. Old Susanna was my first song, and, and we just kind of slowly built on that. Um, I guess just, just I really like the way harmonica worked with blues music. I heard it in rock and roll, but it just didn't have the same appeal to me. Mm. I don't think I've ever heard uh, harmonica in rock and roll music. Well, I'll, have to, I'll have to look that up. Well, sure you have. Uh, the, have I? The Piano Man. Oh, I guess, yeah, that is rock and roll. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that is yeah, that is rock and roll. And lots of other yeah. bands use a harmonica, and contemporary bands use harmonica and rock. So, at uh, what point did you guys start gigging out on your own? Well, I didn't. Uh, it was after school. I came back and uh, I was uh, I was working in the steel industry, and um, I met some fellas in uh, in Columbia. There was a club up there at the time called the Alley Cat. It was in the old Orleans building uh, off of Chestnut Street. And uh, that was kind of like the first night, local nightclub that I was aware of. Now, there were clubs happening, but I was a um, little challenged in being able to get around. So getting over to, uh, getting over, walking over to the Alley Cat was easy. And I met a fellow named George Shinkoski, who was from Marietta. George was ground zero for popular music in the area at the time. And, uh, and he's had a number of bands in succession. I don't think he's playing anymore right now, but he was a great bass player. I thought of songs and types of songs and wrote a lot of original material, always had stuff in, in mind and trying new things. And so he was 
a lot of inspiration. He got me to start singing. I hadn't sung before this. And uh, so I sang with George, and then he introduced me to some people over in Wrightsville, the Zembas, and I worked very briefly for them and had to get over stage fright. I didn't mm-hmm. realize I would have it, but I did, and, and the first job didn't go well. <laughs> eventually, though, uh, working with George, we got into a Gemini Recording Studio in um, Salonga uh, and uh, worked with Steve Paulus, and... It, 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 that kind of, we were trying to record George's original material, and we did, and I still have a nice uh, tape of that stuff. But uh, I, I don't know. Um, uh, it just didn't work out, and consequently, George went his own way, and the rest of us uh, formed the band Hunter, my first band. This would have been 1980. And we had all had an uh, identifying thing with uh, Southern Rock at the time, which was so popular, the Almond Brothers, Marshall Tucker, uh, Wet Willie, and all those different bands from down there. And so we we mimicked them. And uh, we had a five-year career as Hunter all over central Pennsylvania. We competed with original material uh, through Starview 92 when they had their homegrown albums. And um, we recorded a song that I wrote then and another song by our guitar player, Steve Fry. Um, and that was, that was, it was all great learning experiences. And we just played around, and it kind of broke up in uh, 84, 85. Do you want me to go on with that go history on, line? Um, so then I left that band as their singer and playing some harmonica. Um, uh, went with a, a group of fellows that had been the uh, music for the West Philly Speed Boys. And uh, they, Joe Milsom, their singer, had gone on his own. They were looking for somebody to work with. I had left Hunter, so I, I became their vocalist and harmonica player, and we um, did a number of three years of, of jobs. Our first signature job was being the first band in the Chameleon when it was in the back room uh, when he first opened up in a soft opening. We were his first band in, and we enjoyed that band. It was called AWOL, if I didn't say that. Um, it was three years, and there was a little hiatus, and then we got into our 20-year uh, high school anniversary group. I graduated in 69. I had friends who were also musically inclined who graduated in 68. And the class of 68 wanted that group of fellas. They, they had a sock hop band called the Seagrams. So this would have been all through the late 60s. And they wanted them to come together for this 20-year reunion to play some of the old songs that we used to dance to. Yeah, But the, the singer from that band wasn't interested in participating. He did do one song, uh, Stand By Me dedicated it to his wife. But the rest of the hour, I was their singer because I had the experience of doing that. And, uh, and we had a really great time, so great, and we were received so well that the members of my class that were married to members of the class of 68 uh, asked us to stay together long enough to play their class reunion, which was 20 years next year, the following year, 89. So uh, we did. And then that was the beginning of a 20-year... Uh, uh, run for the Silverhawks, and it was a nine-piece band with three horns, female vocal lead, I was the male vocal lead, all the other accompanying instruments, and we played all over. We did not record, but we played all over dance dance situations. We were, I thought we were a great dance band, uh, top 40s, golden oldies, all that kind of stuff. Not really blues, though. And I guess after that band, I left that band in 10, 2010, and I thought, gee, I just, this doesn't suit me anymore. I, I, I'm, I'm tired of this stuff. I'm, I'd like to get into something that's more basic, something that, that you know, preceded this. Uh, maybe not the big swing bands of the war era, but the post-war era. And so I started investigating the different uh, OGs of the blues. Uh, Sonny Boy Williamson II, Rice Miller. Uh, Sonny Boy Williamson one. Um, uh, Muddy Waters, of course, George Monica Smith, and then I started to see how the harmonica was incorporated with this music, how it had more uh, sway, how it was more than just in a little accompaniment in the side and part of the song. It became the song uh, in many cases. Uh, little Walter, uh, Big Walter, Big Walter Horton, um, 
and a number of different uh, uh, artists from that period of time, post-war 40s, 50s, early 60s. Um, so I started to school myself by listening more to them and, uh, and trying to catch up with what the contemporary artists were doing at the time. Uh, Joe Felisco and, uh, um, well, Kim Wilson from the fabulous Thunderbirds, who I was fortunate enough to hear last night in Sellersville. Great show. And, uh, and people like that. And then I stumbled onto this fellow from England. Uh, he lives in Leon the Sea, which is part of Essex, which is all part of London, the east end of London near the Thames mouth. And his name was Steve West Weston. And he was like opening a whole new book on harmonica performance. And I finally got it on a lot of things, technique, um, breathing, um, how to work a harmonica in a song. It, 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 it was just amazing what this guy could tell me by just listening to him play. And so I started to develop more of my, and mimicking him and his songs and other people and, and learning how to use these different techniques of a harmonica player to make music. So uh, what now? What now? Well, um, we've had a great run uh, since uh, the fall of 15 when I first put this band together. Which is called? Blues on the Loose. And uh, we, um, that, came, that, name came, <laughs> that name came from my stock car racing. I had raced stock cars through the, the 90s. And uh, mine, a lot of guys always wrote little sayings on the backs of their cars to antagonize the guys that were following them. Mm -hmm. So, can't catch me or... A whole number of different things. But the slogan I wrote on the back of it was Blue, Lewis on the Loose. <laughs> I thought it was funny for a stock car racer. And, uh, and then as, as I got out of that and, and was playing more blues music and I thought, and decided to put this band together, I thought that that would be a, an interesting name. I, I didn't want it to be about me, like Lewis and whatever. Right. You know, it's so many of those or. I just thought that uh, I wanted to be more inclusive, that everybody who's in the band is contributing to the sound the band makes. And so why should I single myself out? It wasn't, wasn't, didn't seem important to me. So then I called the band Blues on the Loose, which is everybody. And we try to keep it loose. Um, we play uh, very traditional blues material, um, but we play a lot of contemporary blues material. There's There are so many great blues artists, contemporary blues artists out there. And they write and record songs every year that get just so much marginal attention because they're blues and people don't pay attention to the blues like they do mainstream rock and roll. Or, or it's blues is kind of like jazz. Blues and jazz are very, very close, kissing cousins, both of them instrumental in developing rock and roll. But um, both of them are also kind of sidelined some reason they just don't get the attention I think that they could or should um, and the fans of blues and jazz music are ardent fans you, you can't argue that <laughs> um, but uh, yeah I, I just I wanted to see where I could go with this and and I love the journey of exploring these different artists and trying to understand why and where and the whole migration of of uh, country music into into you know personalized blues renditions. And then that whole migration from the South, from the Delta, from Mississippi and Alabama to uh, the pre-war uh, industrial area of uh, around the lakes and Chicago and all of that. And then the war came on and that just exacerbated everything. So a lot of people who were you know, pretty, I don't want to say dirt poor, dirt farmers, but they were, and they, and they needed more income, and they wanted more income, they wanted more, so they moved north, and they found the jobs in the industrial north, and, and then that became the hotbed for these people who had brought their music, their, their, their house diddly bows, you know mm -hmm. what that is, and, 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 and got the better instruments, guitars, harmonicas, going from wash tub string basses to actual double bass uprights, and, and different things like that that, that improved their sound and, and help them develop the blues music. Uh, Willie Dixon being the most instrumental of, of all of those people, in my opinion, uh, was a bass player, but he wrote more songs than you can possibly imagine. And you've heard all of them if you listen to any blues. Um, 
So I kind of got off track there. No, it's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so then, so then I, 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 I invested it's, it's a lot of time into this fellow, Richard Newell. And, uh, and I can't encourage people more to listen to his songs. He's gone now, but uh, this music, that's, that's another aspect of music. Music is, is immortality in, in many ways. Um, think of the people of, well, think of Bach. Right, yeah. You, you still think of Bach and Beethoven. They've been gone for a century or more. Oh. And you still, their music still makes an impact. That's immortality, baby. So I don't know that I have any kind of, you know, strengths like that, but it's some. I mean, I am recorded, and I'm yeah. still working on new recordings. And We have new people that we're working with, and we're always trying to develop the band to reach new plateaus of accomplishment. In, uh, in blues music and bring that story to the people. When I do my shows, I try to give everybody a little insight. I don't claim the songs for myself. I tell them who the author, who the author is, although they would never know otherwise. Yeah, right. And I tell them who those people were and, and what small contribution or big contribution they might have made to blues and then do their song as a tribute. So in a lot of ways, the popularity of tribute bands today, of the old rock bands from the 70s and 80s, I'm a tribute band to blues musicians of today and days past. Yeah, it's really a, a unique... I got the chance to see him at... Uh, oh, where was that at? Doesn't matter. I, I, got to, I got to see you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the Bluebird. At the, at the Bluebird. Bluebird, yeah. Bluebird, Bluebird Inn. Inn. That's Cornwall. where it was. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what a stellar performance. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was yeah, it was really interesting because yeah, you, you had the whole nine yards. You had well, besides like the horns, I guess. Which yeah, we don't. I but you know, and and that was something. Last night when I saw uh, Kim Wilson and the Thunderbirds, he had uh, a, a, a baritone sax and a uh, what? Not a bass sax. Is that the baritone? The really big one. The really big one is the baritone. Yeah. Baritone. So it was a baritone. Like a tenor, probably. And yeah, and I guess the second one was a tenor. Those guys just blew the roof off the place. But I can see now how two horns can be very effective in a blues band, even if you're a harmonica player. You don't have to play harmonica in every song. Right. So that's something that, uh, and I know some really good sax players. So there's there's something. The problem with that is if you have if you have your repertoire established and you haven't already included a horn, Finding a space. Well, yeah. Well, but just the consideration of having a horn player come and play two songs, you, you know. <laughs> right, right. So you have to have to orient it differently, and that's, that's something I've been thinking about. To try and get a horn player, um, I'm uh, a good acquaintance with uh, Jerry Laberant, Laberanti. Do you know him? I do not. Um, there's a lot of people I don't know. Oh, there's another good interview <laughs> I think you would have. Is, uh, Jerry Laberanti is a, sac- a superior saxophone player. And he kind of is an independent that floats around. That's another thing about music that kind of threw me off. Coming up through all those early bands, when you got into a band, you were pretty much dedicated to that band. But today, everybody's an independent. Mm. I'm, 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 I, I, everybody's in three bands. Everybody's in, you know, they're doing more than Everyone's just one sub. project. Yeah, and so then it becomes hard to actually schedule because you're never sure if the people that you're working with going to be available on any given date and and it's, it's so that's that's a little maddening I, I find that very uh uh hard to work with um so i try to find people but i've tried i've also learned to work with that to mm-hmm. kind of try to book a little further out and make sure i have people committed to that assignment before we well before we get there um so right now i'm concentrating with my drummer connor stair my bass player, who's the only other original member with the band from the beginning, and that's Doug Porter. Uh, Doug has recently uh, shifted over from his uh, electric bass. He was playing uh, a Fender Jazz um, to an upright. He got a K double bass, and, uh, and boy, oh boy, what a wonderful transition and what a wonderful addition to our sound and yeah. the appearance of having an upright bass, too, is, uh, is, is wonderful. So... It, it's been a slow growth. Like was this sixth? We're in our seventh year. It's been a slow growth, but it's been a very satisfying and, and solid growth. We're we're all learning, and the people who want to be in it are in it. Mm-hmm. What did you guys do during uh, the pandemic? Oh my god! 
in 2019, we were, we were really flying high. And, and we were doing all kinds of stuff. We were recording. We wrote material. Hey, get the album that you guys... Well, the, 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 yeah, the Backyard Blues CD with the Blue Society of Central PA had been released that fall. And we had gone up to um, Billtown Blues Association to compete in their International Blues Challenge Contest. And uh, Ben Vo won that, ch- that challenge up there, and, and they sent him with a stipend to Memphis for 2020. And that was the last week of, of January 2020 to compete in the International Blues Challenge in Memphis. So he, 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 got, he got lucky. <laughs> he got lucky, and he got sent. And, and he had to compete against all those Northern Tier bands from, oh, right. from up that way in, in uh, Williamsport. Um, uh, we decided uh, that we'd try again, and we found this opportunity in Phoenixville at a club called the Sound Bank, an- another great new club. If you have time to go down and check them out, um, and they had the Steel City Blues Society running an international blues challenge there. So I entered, and we went down, and we were up against five bands from the Philly market, and I thought we don't oh, have no. a snowball's chance. <laughs> <laughs> so. We did our set, and in the middle of the set, the, the kick pedal broke on the bass drum, which interrupted our momentum and the whole right. thing. And But it was amazing how helpful all the other band members, all the other drummers were like, you know, get this thing fixed quick for this guy and get him back. So we finished our set, and, and then there was another band after us. And then we kind of all hang out and having a beer and waiting to see what the judges decided. And oh, I just I still shake my head over it. We won. We we beat them all, and we won, and we got the the backing of the Steel City Blue Society to go to Memphis. So we we Airbnb a house, and uh, we went to Memphis uh, the last week of 2020. Uh, there was some press about Ben and uh, Ben's band and our band in the uh, uh, Lancaster pr- uh, newspaper, um, and uh, we played. We played at the Tin Roof uh, two nights, and we were judged, and. Uh, also, somebody I had talked about earlier, Derek uh, Matson with Slim and the Percolators, mm-hmm. had also won at Bucks County Blues Society, and they were sent down. Uh, so we were all down. We were all alumni at the same period of time, um, me being the senior operator there uh, just by age. Um, but we had a wonderful time, and the experience was unparalleled uh, to be in Memphis with all of these blues bands from around the world, not just America or really? even regionally, but on the stage after us at the Tin Roof was a band from Sweden, a blues band from Sweden. That's cool. Yeah. And there was bands from Austria, there was bands from Australia, there was bands from Germany. Here's a question. Sure. Are those blues bands different in any way to American blues? Well, in some ways, I suppose. It would be hard for me to describe how, but they very, very closely mimic American blues. Okay, but so it's like it's like as if they just took American blues and put it in Sweden. Kinda. Okay. So it, then, then it's the 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 little things about their culture that would right. affect the song it's or the presentation. Changing the lyrically, song. not uh, format. I guess what what I'm trying to say, I, I'm because. It's I'm still, very curious. It's still blues. It's still twelve bar. It's still, still twelve bar. Right. It's just the lyrics are maybe more Swedish than not. They're not American. Well, they all sang in English. They well, did, of course. They I, did one song in Swedish. That was interesting. I, I mean, in, in regards to, like, content of the lyrics. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. It's... It, it, it's, it's blues. Yeah, it's blues. It's blues. Yeah, gotcha. it's, it's an American art form. Gotcha. Uh, um, and so they were, they were so in, uh, entranced with it, like the English were in the 60s. That they they had to mimic it, so they mimicked it, and then it influenced the rest of their material. If they weren't doing sticking with the blues, right. you know. there's another great band out of out of Sweden that uh, that had uh, Steve West uh, Weston as their harmonica player called Trick Bag, Tommy, Tommy Moberg's band called Trick Bag, wonderful group. They came to the West Coast and recorded. Oh, uh, I guess it'd be the early 2000s, maybe the teen 2000 teens. And uh, and had a, a whole palette of artists from the West Coast and the and San Francisco Bay Area work with them on their. It was they have three albums from that tour. And that, that they're wonderful material. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to check them out. Yeah, it's the trick bag. It, it's I'm always curious to hear of like uh, like I had an Australian artist come on. She's a country singer mm-hmm. uh, in Australia. She's like you know 
the Taylor Swift or Carrie Underwood of Australia. Okay. Uh, and it was very curious to hear how country, because country music is also another very American uh form and very popular overseas very popular overseas and i did i didn't clock that i was like wait how is something so american (laughs) so and you know oftentimes with america with americans you either hate country or you love country yeah right there's no in between (laughs) well it's the type of country for me i love country but before 1970 (laughs) yeah fair enough no i i'm with you um but it was so curious hearing her uh style very American, but distinctly Australian. Okay. In a, in the same manner, it was it was it was it was interesting to 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 listen to, uh, the different isms. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how how they how she took it and brought it into her style. It was really it's it's amazing. So I'm curious about how how this international blues thing work. Is it is it every society takes like has their like competition and it ups them up to uh the the international competition um the way i understand it it's a it's a a, you can have a blues society and and perhaps not be a member of the international blues foundation god so that's how it works okay so i think it has involves being a member of the blues foundation and then getting a sanction and having the backing the money right to actually put on a program like that and then bankroll the winner to Memphis. So gotcha. that's, that's a couple thousand dollars. Housing, food. It's still very all interesting. That kind though. Of stuff. It's, yeah. It's very cool. And every band does that same bootstrapping to get there, unless they have some kind of a corporate sponsor or something. Right. But, uh, but most of the bands are very, like I said, they're very bootstrapped. They're just pulling it up every day by themselves and trying to get it done. And they do. It's amazing. It, it really is truly amazing how hard people. So what was it like to go to Memphis and and? It's unparalleled. I I've been to New Orleans and and I love Bourbon Street and I love the whole thing of, of New Orleans. But but um, going to Beale Street, and now I, I have to say I was I was you know it was colored by the fact that the place was overridden with blues artists. <laughs> so what a be- what a better time to be on Beale Street and go to all of those little blues clubs that are full of blues artists from all over from the all world. From all over the world, yeah. yeah. So it was the, the best of the best. It was Nirvana, yeah. you know. It was it was really top of the line. So we had a really great time and get to see these clubs that you only hear about, you know. But it's a, a hell of a drive. It's <laughs> I'm sure. We cut all the costs that we could. Rented one van. Took everybody with us. Was we all like stayed in the same eight house. Hours? Huh? Oh no, it was damn near twenty, I think. Really? Hell yeah. You got to drive down eighty, and then the whole. Length of Tennessee, it, it took quite a while. It took oh yeah, because Memphis is on the other side. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, right, right at the river. Yeah, yeah. You get out of the truck and you're looking at the Mississippi. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm curious what what is uh, you're a harmonica and a singer at the same time. How does that work? Well, you you just have to know how to pace yourself. Uh, breathing is very important with both parts of that. Um, it, well, that's what I got from listening to the, all these other artists, how to compose a song, you know, where to put what, and how to build on it instead of just blah, blah, blah in your face all the time. You, you know, you want to maybe you start out big and then kind of mellow out and, come and finish big, or, or the opposite, you start out slow and get big in the middle and then kind of play out at the end. There's, there's so many dynamics to creating a song and and, and, and how you facilitate the song with the different instruments. And it's fascinating. It's, it's another language. It's, it's like math or it's like computer science. You know, it's another language. And, and I'm not so well-versed in it. I didn't study it in school. Uh, like a lot of people that have uh, you know, budding careers and thriving careers and had a good foundation in, in college or, or music school or, or whatever because they knew early on what their path was going to be. I... I shifted around a lot. I don't regret anything, but I've done so many different things in my life, uh, business, job-wise, or 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 recreationally. Um, I I I worked in the I worked in the antiques business for mm-hmm. for like fifteen years, working for a high-end dealer, like a top two percenter out of Massachusetts. We did all the big shows. My job 
I had worked previously at the Heritage Center Museum in Lancaster for the Lests, who I had mentioned earlier. And Margaret was the design coordinator. So I built exhibits for a museum for 10 years. And, and that got me the experience that this guy needed somebody as he was moving up through the business in the antiques world where he started to do the Philly show. He started to do the New York Armory show. And he needed somebody there to go in ahead of him, build the booth. And when he showed up with the antiques, display and label everything. And then it, it, he felt that I was good enough that uh, suited me up. And then I worked as his assistant during the show. So I, I got a well-rounded. Then following the show, I had a whole other side business of delivering things all over the eastern seaboard. Uh, it, it was pretty amazing. Um, what, do you, what do you think is your favorite antique to have ever worked with? My, my number one collectible is local Civil War memorabilia, um, reunion badges, anything related to the 79th Pennsylvania, the, the 122nd PA. They were both Lancaster uh, area groups. Um, also the 93rd from Lebanon and the 30th PA, which was the first uh, regiment of the Pennsylvania Reserve Corps. Um, so I, I, I had a very deep interest in uh, early American history. I also uh, did living history. I don't prefer to call it reenacting, but um, this was before the music or in between the music. Right. Um, I did revolutionary uh, all through the bicentennial era and then up in through and uh, came in and out of the two different periods of living history and, and thoroughly enjoyed traveling around and doing that and seeing all these great historic sites and making commemorative uh, events to honor the history of the men who served and, and fought and developed our country. I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm also a history nut as well. I love the Civil War area, the World War II area, World War One area, mm -hmm. figuring out how that worked, why that worked, mm -hmm. all the stories in between, because there are some amazing stories of, uh, yeah, a tragedy for sure, but Braveheart, courage on both sides, really. Because... Yeah. Uh, at the basis of it, we're all human, right? And especially during the Civil War, it can be very controversial, but, you know, it's the Civil War, right? Uh, but hearing the stories of, like, Stonewall or hearing Gettysburg all over again, getting to know the the pain and the and the uh, the rawness of the situation. The passion, the, the emotion, passion, yeah. the commitment, the, it, all of that is... is and the Civil War, our American Civil War, was the first extensively documented effort like that by the men involved. Mm -hmm. We didn't really see that before, the diaries. And then, of course, there was so much other written accounts of what was going on, the reporting by the newspapers, everything. And the uniqueness of the Civil War, where it wasn't just pockets of factions, you know, mm -hmm. like every other Civil War mm -hmm. typically is. Mm -hmm. uh, it was distinct, a North... Yeah. And a South. They drew up sides. It was it, it was complete <laughs> sides. It's unlike any civil war in history, really. Because uh, if you think, you know, the Iraq, uh, Syria, Egyptian, Spanish, mm -hmm. all different pockets yeah. trying to fight each other. Yeah. The just but just to hear, but then have like you know you distinctly have these two different sides. Yeah. But then to hear the stories of like the uh, the field hospital hospitals picking up both sides. Sure. And, you know, they're both American. They both speak the same thing. And they're brothers and cousins at some points. A war of brothers. Yeah. yeah. And just to hear all, all the, the tragic but deep stories yeah. that, you, that, uh, that you have there. It's the photography. The photography. tells a story that we didn't have before that. And then you have, what, uh, the first, you know, you know this, the... the uh, it's so incredible. So many firsts. So, so many firsts. So many firsts. So many firsts. Aerial, aerial reconnaissance with uh, Wise, Wise's balloon. Yeah. Yeah. And you had a submarine, the first submarine first ever. Submarine. Was, Huntley. Yeah. yeah. Was, was the Confederates. And the ironclads. And, and the ironclads. Yeah. yeah it, it's, it's incredible. They, they, they set the footprint for a lot of, uh, although, uh, you know, I, I abhor war. Oh, of course. Um, the, the stories involved in it that you when you can't control the war, that you have to kind of get the best part of it out of it. Mm -hmm. So you want you read about the people that were involved and what their story was and why. And that's it is infinitely fascinating. It really is. 
And it, it helps you see just how horrible things can be and make up your own mind about uh, aggression. And uh, It gives you perspective. Yes, it really does help you get your perspective. Well, what, what really matters? <laughs> <laughs> so... Other than the Civil War antiques, whatever, what else an- antiques that are? Uh... Oh, collectible antiques. Yeah. You asked me about that. Um, I, I like um, different types of, of furnishing. I, I'm I like art. I like. Uh, I, I guess most of my art interest though is twentieth century. I'm not I'm not real big on nineteenth or eighteenth century art. It's a little too fussy for me. One of my favorite. Uh, I'm. Uh, Friends with a fellow right here in Lancaster. He was, is just a great fine artist. His name's Jerry Hershey, and I have a lot of his work. I also have work by David Brumbach, who was kind of uh, akin to, or they were, they claimed him as Lancaster's twentieth, uh, twenty uh, later Charles Demuth. He kind of, Demuth was mm-hmm. an early mm-hmm. on in the in the middle of the thirties and the forties, pre war, and then uh, David had his was as prolific and and another thing was that they were both watercolorists which mm-hmm. is a very uh very finite group of people that do that and do it well um i i like modern art i like abstract art i like photorealism watercolors and things of that nature um so i've collected some of that and i guess they're the two things that mean the most to me uh, military Military memorabilia, even Revolutionary War. I have some great oh, little yeah. pieces from the Rev War, and that's another story that's just amazing. Um, I like reading, and um, that's pretty much it. I don't listen to the radio anymore. Oh. <laughs> I just fair enough. Yeah, I just <laughs> and and I have enough music in my life between performing and listening to and trying to find stuff to perform. Mm-hmm. I, you know, when I'm working, I need it to be quiet. <laughs> No, I, I'm with you there. Yeah. I, at some points, I just can't listen to music anymore. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's just too much. That's one quiet. Uh, so you have uh, written originals. What yes. was that song pro- process like? Oh, well, the original song was called A Bad Influence, and it literally was a story about that. Um, I, I live in the city, and there's a common parking lot behind the buildings, and there's a group of neighbors who of similar bend, Mm-hmm. who uh, take the time to congregate and drink beer and socialize. And uh, one evening while we were hanging out, this story started to evolve, and I, I couldn't get it out of my head. And so then I went back in and I made an outline of it, back in my office and I made an outline of it. And so basically we're, we're hanging in the back lot, make, and, and we're carrying on, and the neighbor gives us hell for making too much noise. And the second part, the second verse is, one of the fellows that had come in, his wife had sent him out to pick up chicken for dinner. But he decided to come over to the parking lot because he knew we'd be there and have a beer with us. Well, she called him on the phone because she had tracked him. And she knew where he was. And she said, where's the chicken? We're sitting here waiting for you to bring chicken out. So that became the second verse. And then the third verse was about the chicken. It was about the meal and, and what he had brought home. And I kind of made up the end of the story is that she got her chicken and a little surprise, <laughs> macaroni cheese and a sweet potato pie. She asked me why I thought to buy it. Did not remember she was on a new diet. Well, I set it on the table while she was going off, and I'm looking for the door because I've heard enough. She ate that chicken, the mac cheese, the pie every bit. She ate it so fast, I didn't even get to try it. And the band sing, He's a Bad Influence, which is the chorus line through the, the hook. He's a bad influence. And then I say, really? Boy, that's cold, fellas. I see it like this. She's a bad influence. And that's how the song ends. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> yeah, so it's just a, write what you know. That's what everybody tells me. Write what you know. So this was a little story that evolved in front of me. And I thought, okay. And it became a pretty decent song, I thought. that Everybody likes it. Everybody seems to like it. I have other ones that I really shouldn't have. I wrote a song called Crawfish Fishing. I'm not from the Delta, but mm. I know what goes on down there. And, and so I, and, and when we were in New Orleans, I just had a real up close experience with a little bit of the Dell, a little bit of the Cajun influence and the culture down there and all those kinds of things. And it was wonderful. I'd go back in a heartbeat. Um, and so I used that to write Crawfish Fishing. Now I haven't recorded that. 
But uh, that's a good song, I think, too. Um, my songs tend to be up-tempo uh, and somewhat humorous. I haven't been able to write a very serious song. I don't know why. No, it's, I mean, humorous songs are done well. Yeah. And they're great. I used uh, um we have a thing in Lancaster called First Friday. Mm-hmm. And, and it's they, they concentrate on local downtown business and especially the art scene. Yes. And so, uh, so I wrote a song called And Then It Rained. And it was about me and my wife getting ready to go out for First Friday to see the art shows and everything. And what it morphs into is that we're all dressed up, we're walking down the street, and then it rains. Mm-hmm. So it messes everything up. So then I wrote another verse. It, it Parallel, the song keeps kind of following that idea that we're, we're going out, we're going to do something, and then it rains. So it's just goofy songs like that. <laughs> uh, but that, that is, that's truly life, though. Yeah. Like when you get ready to go somewhere and then it rains, you're like, oh, I can't. Nope, not anymore. <laughs> I wanted to write a song about the, oh, you know, how strange you can get off on these eddies. Um, I wanted to write a song about the pandemic and about the, um, I started one, writing one about the, uh, the stipend that people were getting from the government. Uh, I forget what they called that. Stimulus check. Yeah. Uh, right? Yeah. Stimulus checks? Yeah yeah, 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 that's it. And uh, uh, I didn't get that one finished, but, but we, we, we did that thing in 2020 in that last week of the first month. And when we came home, we played one more job, and that was the Gap job. The um, Kevin Gannon put together an event because of the pandemic. Rich couldn't have Roots and Blues. Mm-hmm. So he put together this bridge event at uh, it was over in Mulberry Street. Um, and uh, it was a nice concert of all local bands uh, performing. I think the money was given to uh, Rich. I think at the time he was in, he was having some problems. Plus his wife had cancer and things yeah. weren't going well for him overall. So it was kind of a benefit for him to, to help with uh, all the things that he was involved in. Uh, but it was a great time. And we have been in the we – were, we were very fortunate with, uh, to work with Rich uh, because – after we formed the band in the end of 15, he had the next Roots and Blues that uh, in 16. It was in, still in February. He was having them in February. And, and and for being no older a band than we were, he had us play in the lobby of the of the uh, Marriott, uh, independent of what else was going on. And we have been in the Roots and Blues Festival ever since, every year ever since, uh, either as part of the regular lineup in, in 20. Well, in 21, we played at the TELUS in the front. But this past year, he had the show in July, and we weren't part of the regular lineup. But he, a VIP event, right? he used yeah. us for the VIP event down at the Southern Market, which is actually a great venue for bands. I was surprised. I thought the acoustics in there would be horrible, but they weren't, and it was really good. We had a really good show there, and a lot of people uh, told us so. Um, so, so Roots of Booze has been a big help to our band. I hope we were a help to, uh, to Rich. Um, but then the 2020 just killed it. We lost all of our work in 2020. Yeah, we didn't have any gigs to play after that bridge event. And um, it took, we at the end of the year, then I, I asked a couple of the fellows who wanted to get back together, and we started rehearsing every Monday night, Jay and Doug and I. And we were having trouble finding a, a drummer and um, somebody that wanted to, who appreciated blues, right? Appreciated jazz or blues. Everybody we were finding were rock drummers, and most of them were self-educated. We just we just couldn't gel right. It didn't seem that way to me. But then we found this fellow Connor Stair. He's uh, he's really quite the student of percussion, and and, and a great drummer. And and the and then, and then we also picked up another guitar player. Uh, Anthony Wayne Pericini, uh Tony Wayne, and uh, he's a stellar guitarist. He's but the problem with him is he's so busy because he's so good that he's hard to nail down for a job. But I'll work with that. That's okay, Tony. We'll work with that. <laughs> <laughs> the, and these guys are in their twenties. I'm seventy one. How many businesses or or groups do you know that that have that kind of bleed? Where somebody generational that's gap, old yeah. enough to be their grandfather is working with them in a popular contemporary popular music band in public. A lot of people wouldn't even a lot of young people wouldn't even consider. I mean, we're an old guy like that. But the 
these guys embrace it, and I embrace them, and we're having the greatest time. We're all learning. How um, have you ever seen? Uh... Because you're getting up up in the age, has your performance ever changed? Have you had to lay back at all, or are you still just running? Um, I, well, I, we ran her pretty hard up until this year. I'd have to say that uh, uh, I don't deal with the heat as well as I used to. Uh, so playing outside during the day can be very challenging if you don't, don't have coverage. Um, I, yeah, I, it's hard to say no when anybody calls you to book your band. Mm. So we had, oh my God, we played every weekend in June this year and every weekend in July, but we didn't get started till May. We didn't have anything until May. So it's, it's uh, you know, pieces of pudding and lumps of pie. And, and you never quite know with the, in this business. We don't have a manager, although we just did start to work with uh, uh, Master Petrio. Uh, this is last night. I'm trying to think. Of um, Peter. Peter, that's Peter. it. Yeah, Mastriano, yeah. yeah. He's uh, he booked us for uh, Capona this year. We had never worked with an agent, and uh, uh, we had never worked up at Capona. We did do the Spring Arts Festival. Uh, that was, so there was this year was our first time in the Harrisburg events, and and that's good because I think we could do you know well up there. We just we it's hard to get out of Lancaster, uh, and there's not a lot of acceptance of blues music in Lancaster area. It's it's a tough nut. Really? Oh yeah. I thought they, it'd be different. No, they like golden oldies here. They like old music, old. Uh, You're popular, not wrong about that. Popular dance music, and so people who are thinking outside of that box, it's a harder trip um, to get acknowledged and or to find clubs that want to use you because they don't get the same turnout as they do for bands that are playing songs that everybody knows forever. Yeah. And I'm playing songs that nobody's ever heard, <laughs> right? <laughs> but to each his own, hey. Well, yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the the struggle for every band. It's like, well, if you're playing originals, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah, right. You have to throw in covers in there and stuff that's like might might be completely opposite to what your uh what your originals are. Yeah. And so that's that's the struggle for every every band person. Uh, it's either you're a tribute band or you're an original artist playing only covers. Basically, yeah. So, so it is. So you try to find different markets. I'm pushing everything I can to get into the Philadelphia market because mm. there are so many other blues bands down that way, and everywhere from Greater Philadelphia, Northern Delaware. Uh, and up into Bucks County, Montgomery County, up into that area, there's all kinds of little clubs and breweries that sponsor the Derek, the Little Red Rooster Band out of Doylestown, a fantastic four-piece blues band. Um, Nick Trill, Mikey Jr., who I st spoke about before, um, Bob Mongo Margolis, um, just a whole group of different people. And so, I, you know, it's, it's, it's like the carrot that I can't reach mm -hmm. the Philly market I'm trying to get into those rooms down there. So by getting up into Harrisburg, but hopefully uh, for different events, we'll get some recognition and maybe there'll be more opportunities for us up there. York's also a tough nut to crack. That's a heavy metal town. Yeah. And, uh, so I haven't really tried to play in York, but, uh, I'm hoping maybe festivals might give us a break there. And, um, yeah, this, the Susquehanna Folk Festival, I guess. You could probably make a way into that one. I don't know about that. They're pretty folky. They're pretty okay. folky, and they would view us, because we don't do a lot of acoustic, we do some acoustic blues, but because we, we're mostly electric blues. Um, gotcha. Yeah, that, I don't think we'd cross over into the Susquehanna Blue or Folk uh, Society. But being in the Blues Society is, the, is our biggest asset. Right. Uh, they, they take care of their own. They give us opportunities. We played at Fort Hunter for a big show up there that they had. Um, and then they have, like, events quarterly plus personal events. Like, they have a big Christmas show every year. They bring in name acts from all over the country. Two years ago, we had Tad Robinson from Indianapolis, a fantastic soul singer, blues singer, plays harmonica, does all these types. Um, I can't remember all of them, but just – really great talent and they have a picnic in the summertime that usually includes a lot of the member bands uh, and showcase and then they have 
we we opened for uh, Sugar Ray Norica and the Blue Tones two years ago, 19, before all this stuff happened. Um, and other bands like uh, Ben Brandt, uh, Ben Vo, um, uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank here, uh, <laughs> Nate Myers, mm. Nate Myers and the Aces, uh, different bands like that from the, the greater Harrisburg area, which I guess includes Lancaster, uh, or anybody that wants to make the effort to become part of the organization. They'll feature them. They'll use them as openers for these name acts, and that's always a little bit of a leg up, you know, for your career as a band, trying to get acknowledgement and get uh, accolades for having played with people who are further up in the business. So how does a, a musician get involved in the Blues Society? Very simply, just you can you can apply online. I think it's $15 a year, and the benefits are just, for the money, You, you it's a pittance. It should be even twice that, and it would still be not worth the volume of return you get for the money. You know what I'm saying? It's, just, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's uh, the things that you can get out of the club. Plus, every Thursday night, every Thursday night, it would have to be calamitous weather to keep this from not happening. Every Thursday night at Champions Sports Bar in High Spire, easily found just above the airport on the main river road, they have a blues jam, a blues jam. Don't come there playing rock and roll. They'll, they'll ask you off the stage. But they, they signs up at 7 o'clock. The host, which I was last week, assembles the bands from the people who sign up, kind of in the order that they signed up. So you make up the bands and the two guitars, a vocalist, bass, drums, harmonica, keyboards, horns. All these people are welcome in, and everybody gets a chance to play. You may not always get to play with who you expect or who you want to, but that's part of the beauty of it. We're right. all helping each other learn and teach each other our, what we never have learned uh, by playing together. So sometimes the sets are maybe a little dud because of the inexperience of the players in it. Um, well, that's okay. That's okay. Or, or they're stellar because you know some Everyone's real in. hot shots came out and they got grouped into because they came late. You know, they mm. came late, so then they didn't get signed up until the fifth set, which might start at 9.30 or a quarter of a 10. But sometimes they're some of the best sets. Um, and it's just, it's just and that's every Thursday night from 7 to 10. You, it, there's no admission. Anybody who's a musician who's interested in blues music can come and sign up and play. It's not an open mic, per se. We're, we're not doing the Box Tops or the Doobie Brothers. We're playing blues music. Contemporary blues music, blues music, old blues music, whatever. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, oh, what's my next question? Maybe you could think of doing a live podcast from one of those events. That'd be cool. Yeah. That'd be cool. I'll bet you could get it done. I bet I could get it done. There's a lot of things I could get done if I... <laughs> we all could. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> Life gets in the way. It, it, truly, <laughs> honestly. Um, what is your favorite story... Regarding music? Wow. Gee, that's a stopper, isn't it? Mm. My favorite story involving music. Uh, I'm sorry for this dead air. Oh. I, I, I can't come up with any one thing that's sticking out in my mind. I guess just the opportunity to play for for other people and through the society I've gotten to be asked on the stage to play with different musicians that they've they've had uh, uh, one of the one of the more stellar events that we had was out at Stoner Grill in the upper mm. the upper level they had a, a, a CD release by Benny Turner who uh, is uh, signed to uh, Blue Heart Records um, um, Sally Bankston's label uh, Blue Heart Records and I, there's another one there too Rack Blind Raccoon, I think. Um, anyway, uh, she has uh, people like Clarence Spady, uh, um, Dawkins, Daryl. And this was a show with uh, Benny Turner and Daryl Dawkins uh, together for this release. And we were the opener for him. And then during their show, they asked me to come up and blow a harp with them, behind them. And that that was, a, that was a, 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 one of my more fond memories of getting to play with some some uh, recording artists, um, some people who are now would be considered the OGs, the survivors. Um, 
uh, Benny Turner uh, is the brother of Freddie King and toured really? with Freddie King for years. I think I have that right. Wow, that's pretty cool. Maybe I shouldn't have said that, but I believe that's correct. Um, anyway, the, the point is that you yeah. toured with them. <laughs> well, I didn't tour with them. I, no, got, uh, I got to play a gig yeah, right, with right, them right, yeah. at one of their, one of their events. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of stories. It's hard to pick one out. What's the time where um, everything went wrong? We had an event. <laughs> we had the first event of this year was in February, and it was at our home base, which I consider 551 West. Mm. And I was in the middle of a transition. I was trying to add musicians to the band. I was trying to find a more permanent drummer who was filling our needs. And so we had a polyglot of musicians, and we had this gig to do at 551. So we're playing leftover music from the first iteration of the band pre-pandemic because we lost the drummer and the keyboard player during that period of time. So then I had to start over with the guitar and the bass and then build on that mm -hmm. so that by 21, we're starting to book again. And, uh, and then we had a strong 21 and helped reestablish the band. But we played more hardcore blues music, which was my direction. The, the previous iteration of, of the band w w had a heavy influence by our keyboard player, Tom Lowry. And it was welcome because I was trying to establish a band. We were looking for influence. and We were looking for types of material to play. And he had a different direction. Now, he had previously been with the Speed Boys. He was one of the Speed Boys. So he had a, lot, he had a big background in rhythm and blues and, and blues-type music. So he was a good influence. And... Um, uh, but he influenced the band in a particular way. And then after he left and we reformed, then I wanted to go with a much harder blues sound. Not, not so much Chicago, but, but I was chasing all these contemporary blues harmonica player singers, and I wanted to do some of what they were doing. And uh, so then that influenced the type of music that we were doing. And there, uh, what went wrong? There were too many musicians there. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And it was the same night that Rich showed up to kind of evaluate how we were doing as a band. Oh, no. With the potential opportunity to play in Roots of Blues again. And I don't think he was impressed. Because <laughs> we weren't very well organized. Gotcha. And it just looked sloppy. And I'll admit to it. But it, it was also a, a very a crucible time for us. And it, it, it was an asset because we learned a lot about ourselves and we learned a lot about what we wanted. And we met new people. This is, that's when we met Tony. Uh, and we were working uh, with his buddy Jeremy. He was playing drums for us at the time. Jeremy's usually a bass player, but he's a multi-instrumentalist. And uh, so he was a great asset. But then we found Connor uh, through a mutual friend. And Connor is like a heartbeat. He's the, absolutely the best drummer we've ever had. Uh, and uh, he has really helped the band. And we, we, we knew all along that the, that the bass and the drums were the, were the, the core of any good band. They right. had to be like Siamese twins. Well, I shouldn't say that. They should be like co-joined twins. And, um, and these guys are getting more and more and more like that every day, every rehearsal, every gig gets those two guys tighter all the time. And, and we have definitely improved. My wife is our hardest critic, and she definitely believes that we have ascended a new level as a band. And then we get accolades from members of the Blues Club. Michael Knott, Michael Knott thinks, who goes to all of the blues shows and all of the festivals. He's seen so many bands. Really feels that we, we are of a level that we can make that next step up and that we should be recording. But... Uh, Boy, writing a song is not an easy trick. No. <laughs> a good not song. You, know, you can right. write all kinds of sloppy junk, but to write a good song that will grab people's attention, will touch them, and, and leave a memory. That's what music's supposed to do to me, for me. It touches people. It, you're, you're having an emotional exchange with them. It's a very personal thing. So uh, we're kind of rounding out our time here, so I have a few questions just Please. to wrap it up. Yep. What is one thing that you know now that you, in regards to music that you wish you had known when you first started? 
I, I, one thing that I uh, regret that I have about music is that although I learned how to read drum music, it's all on one line. So I never learned to read scale. Scale. And that I regret very Reading much. horizontally is I, yeah, very I, important. I can't, <laughs> I can't read notation and apply it to my instrument. So all of my music, uh, besides the drum, my bass playing, I, I studied with, uh, uh, oh gosh, Jeff, or Joe uh, Goff. Joe Goff was a, mm. a named guitar player back in the 70s and 80s. I studied with him, but I didn't, but it was all rote. I didn't, he didn't insist on me learning to play sheet music. And uh, also then harmonica was followed that suit too. That's all by rote. That's pretty much listen to what's going on, mimic that, and then add it into what you're doing to make it you. Hmm. So I regret that I never learned to read scale. That's my, my fear. What is, outside of that, what is one, one of your uh, bigger mistakes and, that you have made or you've seen other people make, and how can we prevent those for the younger generation? Just be a little more open-minded and a little more forgiving. You know, let people make their mistakes. Don't, don't write them about it. Um, and be encouraging. I, 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 well, I make the effort to drive down to Philadelphia market to go to these clubs. It, it, it partially, I would like to try and see my band in those clubs, and I make an effort at that. But it's as much and more to go and support these guys and to tell them that people are listening and we do like what you're doing and, and go for it, stay in it. So I love encouraging young musicians to, to stay in it and, and, and learn to read and learn the theory and learn those, all those things because they will all help you in your final product. So if you, if, you, if you know early that you want to be a musician, and that's good because I came in kind of late, but um, stay with it. You know, and, and I like to encourage people to stay in it. Yeah, especially learning uh, all your scales and all that jazz. Yeah. Uh, because it, especially if you're playing blues, it's, it's, it's a solid form. <laughs> it's very predictable. And if you learn that form and you know your scales, you can kill it on any song ever. Exactly. It's it's form it's somewhat formulaic, and you got a, an outline of twelve bars, eight bars, sixteen bars. Mm -hmm. But it's what you put into that. It's you that makes the difference. So, what is one of the funniest things that have ever happened to you at a gig? Uh, okay. Well, I won't use any names. <laughs> but uh, we we played uh, we played a party a private party one time in a dairy barn up in Lebanon, <clears throat> and the people the woman who hired us really liked us really liked us and she thought we would go over gangbusters. The people who came didn't know what to make of us, and in her in her enthusiasm, her zeal to get people to dance, to just even dance, or to enjoy the band, or, or to, what they were doing was going off in little groups and having conversation and just totally ignoring us while we were playing. She got on, a, it was near Halloween, and it was, you know, a lot of dried corn and pumpkins and stuff. And she, she got on a corn stalk, like a corn bundle, uh, and started riding it around, trying to, to be Paul Revere for the band in her own party. It was it was hysterical. <laughs> that would be one of the funniest moments, um, and, 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 and nothing on her, but just the whole episode was right. just, oh my God, we could hardly keep it together to keep playing. How do you engage a, a, a non-engaged audience? That's a good one. Well, it, 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 I try to... I try to personalize the music by telling, you know, like I say, I try to introduce the songs without getting too long-winded, uh, telling them who wrote it, when they wrote it, uh, and what related to that, and, and, and so that they have a little personal insight to the song. I, I don't know how else to engage people. Mm. You know, I try to be engaging on stage, um, but that only goes so far. And if you don't have an you know, an audience that can appreciate blues music well, and you're you're really batting one handed. Um, I don't I don't know. That's a tough question. Yeah, you, you do question. what you can. You try to appeal to them. Uh, 
Maybe you change your set and play some slow songs that will engage them because they don't know how to dance to blues music. I don't know how anybody could not know how to dance to blues music. Right, so just move your body. <laughs> just get out on the floor and move around a little bit. Just relax and enjoy yourself. But some people get real uptight, especially if they don't know. I don't know that song. I don't know that much. I don't, and then they're, right. Yeah, I don't know why they do that, but they do that. All right, last question. Yeah. Where can people find you and where are you performing next? Uh, well, like I, you had uh, generously uh, announced in the beginning, uh, you can find us at www.bluesontheloose.com. And I try, I have a descriptive page. I have uh, some audio on there, uh, video. Uh, I, there's a page to get in contact with. There's a whole page of photographs that kind of cover us through the last seven years. Uh, and then I have a schedule page at the end that I keep up to date to keep everybody informed of where we're playing and when. Uh, we also have a, a Facebook page, Blues on the Loose Facebook. Uh, my page, Louis Bechtold, will also get you information about the band. Uh, call me, write me. I'll be happy to answer anybody's questions. And if you can engage us, we'd be happy to perform for you. Well, this has been a lot of fun. It I'm, has. Yeah, I'm uh, super excited. Oh, you guys are performing at the Eastburg Blues Fest Saturday, right? Our next gig will be September the 3rd at the East Petersburg Blues Fest, which will feature Acoustic Stew, uh, Smokehouse 4, Blues on the Loose, Bobby Gentillo. Yeah, Bobby Gentillo. Uh, Bobby Gentillo. And these, these last three are all recording artists for the Blue Heart label. Uh, Bobby Gentillo, um, Tiffany Pollock. Pollock. Yeah, she's yeah. going to be there. Hey, if you've not heard this oh, woman, she is amazing. you have got to hear this woman sing. She is so entertaining. She's so one of good. those people you can't resist. And then Clarence Spadey is the headliner. So it should be, and that's a free blue show. A free one, blue. Yeah. At the community park at the Band Shell in East Petersburg. Uh, parking's free. The show's free. There'll be food <laughs> trucks. There'll be a beer garden. I know what I'm doing Saturday, September 3rd. And it's free. <laughs> you can't miss it. You can't, can't miss out. Then the following uh, Monday, Labor Day Monday, we're at Capona at, on the main Market Street stage from 2 to 3. And, uh, and then finishing up September is uh, Marion Court. We've never played at Marion Court before. But this will be our debut there, and uh, hopefully they might be interested. I know that, that the owner, Mike, is, uh, Mike uh, Aguizzi, is a big blues fan, loves Delta mm. music, loves the Delta blues, and uh, has a shows periodically uh, at uh, Marion Court on like Sundays, and uh, I thought if he'd get to hear us, that maybe he'd give us an opening slot for one of those touring acts. But uh, he's got to hear us, and he's <laughs> busy. He's a busy man, so he doesn't get to get out and see or hear us. Uh, but he gave us his gig, so we're going to play. That'll be the 16th of September, and sadly, that's our last booked event for the year. Mm. I'm trying to get work, and I'm just not getting any callbacks right now. Um, I don't know why, but that is it, it, that's a feast of famine with this business. Well, hey, if you want to hear, uh, if you want to get blues music on your show, reach out to Blues on the Loose. Yeah. With all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the day. If you like this episode and want to hear more, you can search us anywhere. Just look up the story Koi Rosen. That's C O R Y R O S E N. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that jazz. Uh, Facebook, if you want to keep up to date with our future events and guests. We're kind of taking a hiatus this week. We won't be back until Friday, where we have uh, returning guest, Grammy Award winner Doris Hall Galati, and we're going to hear more about her and her life and how how in the world does she become a Grammy Award winner. Wow, that's exciting. Yeah, that's going to be, that's gonna be an, another fun one. With all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.